Hello, everyone, and welcome today. My name is Julie Bertarelli, and I'm the Operations Coordinator for OHF. Um, we're welcoming you here today to the OHF on the Road webinar series, which is a place to learn, engage, connect with families, patients, and caregivers. Through this virtual webinar series, we are uniting to build and activate the hyperaxillary community at a personal level. In this three-part webinar series, we will connect on emotional wellness, what's causing my kidney stones, and today, how to harness the power to make a difference. A few housekeeping items today before we get started. The webinar is approximately 45 minutes. All participants will be muted to allow speakers to present without interruptions. The webinar will be recorded for later viewing on OHF's YouTube and social media channels. To ask questions during the webinar, please use your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time, we will follow up with you all via email. A, a thank you today to our sponsors for this OHF on the Road webinar series, especially El Nylum and Dicerna, our partner sponsors. Today's topic, harnessing the power to make a difference. Today, you will hear stories from others in the rare disease space who, despite their diagnosis, recognize that they could make a difference. These and other patient leaders have taught us that in order to succeed in our mission for treatments and to cure, we must leverage and bolster the power of you in our efforts. No one is more motivated than you to drive progress against your own disease. You'll learn how to make a change and break down barriers, and you can take that next step. Our guest speakers today are Rob Long, Executive Director at Uplifting Athletes, and Anthony DiVergelo, Internal Digital Communicator, our, our Odyssey board member, and Deshen, Muscular Dystrophy Patient Advocate. We have everybody on the screen here. I think everyone can see. So without further, we also have Kim Hollander, OHS Executive Director joining us today. So without further ado, I am going to turn this webinar over to Robert Long. Oh, sorry, we're gonna start with Anthony. Sorry about that. Anthony is a motivated communication professional with a focus in rare disease space. He lives with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a disease that weakens his muscles over, over time but he never lets it stop him from advocating for every person with a rare disease to be fully included in society. Anthony is currently concentrating his energy on the social barriers that the pandemic has brought into the public view, such as the need for a virtual option for every in-person event and increased video game accessibility. So Anthony, we will turn it over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh are you hired to harness the power to make a difference? So I guess I'll start um, my story with uh, when I was younger, um, I always had difficulty being social and getting out and into the world and feeling like I was a part of society or community. Um, I think a big part of that was a lot of people did not know about my disease or what I was going through. Um, and what really like made the shift for me to be more social, be more accepted, feel part of the community was when I started to share my story uh, with my classmates. Uh, this was in the senior year of high school. My uh, English teacher from the previous year, who I'd given two of my uh, poems to, called From the Outside Look the End to the Eyes of a Child, uh, that were about my difficulty of being social and um, difficulty uh, dealing with inaccessibility when I'm going out in the world or trying to go to a friend's house and I can't get in. Um, and also about how people, uh, children around the world would, like when I'm out in the world, they would stare at me and a lot of them would be uh, willing to ask questions and come up to me and ask like about my disability or when I'm in a wheelchair. Um, but on the other side of that, there would be a lot of adults that would just stare and never come up to me and never uh, socialize with me. So that poem kind of highlights the stark difference between when we're young, we're always willing to question and willing to accept. And I just really want to teach people from a young age, and I want to make sure that they keep that acceptance and willing to willingness to socialize and ask questions. Um, 
because I think what made it difficult for me to be accepted at high school was a lot of people did not know what I was going through. They may not know what to share my certificate is. It's a muscle uh, weakening disease that slowly weakens my muscles over time. Um, for until I was about age eight, I was able to walk, and then I had to move to a wheelchair. Um, and now I use an invasive ventilator to breathe and a feeding tube to help me eat. So back in high school, I uh, started talking to one of the classes about like what I was going through, my disease. I was really amazed at how people opened up and asked questions and really realize that they like even though they may not have a disability or may not be going through what i am we kind of share in our experiences and that like kind of allowed them to socialize with me more to invite me uh to hang out with them to um continue to share my story and i think like that feeling of acceptance and openness and the feeling of being that people care about what I have to say and care about my story. I think that really helped transform me into the social butterfly that I am today. Um, but about two years ago, before the pandemic, I still had that nagging feeling that I was not fully involved in society as I could be. I was working at a amazing pharmaceutical company called Amicus Therapeutics, where I manage communications, but other than that amazing community at work, I didn't feel like I was part of the larger rare disease community. Um, and that changed when, during the pandemic, all of the technology that we, uh, that allows us to stay connected virtually, um, started to become more prevalent, we use and more important. And when the virtual world opened up, the entire world opened up for me and allowed me to connect with other people in the rare disease community. It allowed me to find our Odyssey. And after attending a couple of meetups uh, for young adults with rare disease with our Odyssey, I decided to join their board. And I've also been able to attend the International Association of Business Communicators virtual conferences. And really, I would say without the world opening up like that, I probably would not be in this panel today or in the panel I was on on Green Disease Day. And I really wouldn't have had the opportunity to share my story and connect with all of you. So I'm really grateful that technology has opened up like that, and I hope that it stays that way. And to me, it's kind of silly that it took a pandemic for the world to finally open up for me. So I'm always fighting for a virtual option for every in-person event, because that allows people around the world to have people with disabilities or Many people that are caring for someone with disability or may not be able to travel, it allows everybody to be involved in um, events worldwide. And that kind of led me to uh, a different kind of community where um, the video game accessibility community, it was something new for me. I really had never really delved into that community. I, I for a while, I didn't really have trouble playing video games, but more recently, I um, have not been able to use a physical controller. And like video games was my life. It's what I always loved to do. It was my main hobby and it was like meant the world to me. Um, I guess it's really because like playing video games allowed me to to walk around, to do things that I normally would not be able to do in real life. And also it allowed me to meet other people and meet other gamers and um, also do it with my friends in person. But when I lost that ability, it kind of was difficult for me at first. 
because, like I said, that was my life. So I, uh, one of the last games I played uh, was a uh, one of the old Mario games. I purchased that game and I was kind of baffled when I opened it up and it asked me to point my controller at the screen in order to play. And like, I can't move my arms i can't move the controller up so like that was kind of the last straw for me i'm like that's crazy just in order to play a game in order to save the game you have to um be physically able to lift the controller so that baffling moment was what inspired me to um, put out a tweet that was later picked up by Game Explain. It's a uh, large YouTube channel dedicated to video games, and they uh, reached out and wanted to interview me about the difficulties I have and like how the entire industry can make games more accessible. So I accepted the interview, and it was a really amazing experience. And believe it or not, the YouTube comment section, which is normally a minefield of negativity. For this video, it was a, a community. There are people talking about their disability and the difficulties they had. Um, and of course, there are people that would say that if you can't play a game, then don't play it. Um, but the community and other people that with disabilities kind of steered away from that negativity and kind of show people that video games, like any video, should be accessible for everybody. And like that well-received video and that positivity in that community, it really inspired me to uh, work on an idea I had previously had to create a fully virtual um, uh, accessibility controller on the computer that will allow me to play with just um, moving my finger on the touchpad. Um, and will allow me to play even with my limited abilities. So I reach out to a Facebook group called the Playability Initiative and we share my idea and one of the developers reached out to me and decided to help me out with it. And then we also decided to not only make the accessible controller, but to also um, raise awareness of, of video game accessibility by live streaming our development on Twitch. And like that small idea, I'm proud to say like a year later, we're about to release the full version. I've been uh, working with uh, Microsoft and some other developers integrating into their systems and like really all it took was that small idea and just asking for help with it that allowed me to make it happen but also allowed me to find a community of like-minded individuals like myself who um, love video games and want to make them accessible so i guess my lesson to all of you is you have the power inside of you to make a difference. It just takes sharing that idea and like running with that. I even and I would say no idea is too small. Um, no idea is too silly. Like if you believe in something, um, I think you can make it happen. It may take a little longer than you think, but in the end, it will allow you to do what you love. And I'm just proud that Overjoyed Virtual Controller exists now and that we're working towards the goal of making all video games accessible for everyone. So I hope that inspires some of you to pick an idea that you've been thinking about for a while and run with it. Thank you. Anthony, I am completely inspired. I'm not a video person, but um to hear you say that you had the ability to walk around and interact through a video game and what that freedom meant to you was something I'll take with me for the rest of my life.
So thank you for sharing that. Just a, a quick question, Anthony. When you're giving these talks, I think what was the moment you realized that you needed to get involved, not only in your uh, disease that affects you, but also ra all rare diseases? I would say it's because we, like all people with rare diseases deal with very similar challenges. And like, I wanted to be able to share my experience with them because maybe something I had gone through might be able to help um, improve their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you. Julie, I'll turn yes, it back to you. Thank you. Next up is our speaker. We have Rob Long. Uh, am I off of mute? Rob Long, the executive director of Uplifting Athletes. Rob is a former All-American punter at Syracuse University has lived, and has lived the rare disease journey. In December of 2010, Rob was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of brain cancer. A graduate of Syracuse University, Rob pursued an MS in New Media Management with the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. He also received a BS from the Martin J. Whitman School of Management. Rob became the second executive director of Uplifting Athletes at the end of 2018. Prior to taking over as the executive director, Rob served as Uplifting Athletes Director of Rare Disease Engagement for nearly two years. So I welcome you, Rob. I will stop sharing my screen and toss it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie and Kim, for having me. Uh, let me share my screen here. I think uh, hopefully this will work. All right, how does that look? Looks great. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, Anthony, your story is incredible. Thank you for, for sharing that. And, and thank you, Julie and Kim, for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about my journey. Um, as you can see here, this uh, presentation is, is taught to, or titled the, uh, My Journey from an Athlete to a Patient to an Advocate. And so um, for me, this is uh, a, a, an awesome opportunity kind of to share my story and, and a little bit about um, what I'm doing now. So uh, my story starts, uh, as um, Julie mentioned, I, I played football at Syracuse University. I was fortunate to have uh, a great career there and um, was really uh, excited about what the future held for me. I was the top punter in the, the country going into the 2011 NFL draft. Um, my biggest concern in life was what NFL team I was going to end up on. Um, and five days after my, my, legger, my last regular season game, um, that really all changed. Um, in a, a matter of, uh, you know, a couple of days, I was, uh, went from, you know, preparing for the NFL draft to uh, being told that I had a, a rather large growth in my brain. Um, you can see on the screen that the bottom right picture is actually a, uh, a front view of my head. So you'd see the tumor um, was actually in the back right portion of my brain and, and took up about a quarter of my brain. Um, it was quite large. And uh, I was sent home to Philadelphia for emergency brain surgery. Uh, they were able to remove the tumor. Um, but uh, just six days later, uh, after surgery, I got the pathology report back and was diagnosed with uh, a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. It's a, a rare aggressive form of brain cancer. Um, uh, the five-year survival rate of my, my cancer is 15% at the time of my diagnosis. And um, the doctors pretty much had told my parents that they, you know, expected that I, I may live, a, you know, another 36 months. And, um, you know, this picture that actually you see on the bottom right hand screen is, a, is from the day of my 22nd birthday. Um, so I was rather young when I went through all this and, and this happened. And so, um, but kind of through this and, and through this experience is, is kind of what has um, shaped my life um, today. My teammates at Syracuse started uh, the first chapter uh, at Syracuse of Uplifting Athletes in my honor and um, something that to this day I'm, I'm incredibly uh, honored by and uh, it's just one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me in my life and, and has really um, provided me a, a path to kind of utilize my story and what I've been through 
um, to help those in the rare disease community. So I, I went through this journey. I, I my teammates started the Syracuse chapter of uplifting athletes in 2012, and for uh, about four or five years, I just remained really involved with the Syracuse chapter, helping them with their fundraising events and and talking through. Uh, talking to the team and throughout the community about the importance of supporting uplifting athletes in the rare disease community. Um, and in 2016, I reached out to our executive director at the time, a gentleman named Scott Shirley, who's also our founder. Um, and I said, Scott, is there an opportunity for me to join the organization full time? I, I feel like this is a calling for me and something I would love to be a part of um, and, and do this full time. And fortunately for me, there was an opportunity uh, to join the organization. And so uh, I was able to join the organization in, in uh, September 2016. I was promoted to the executive director role in uh, October 2018. And from there have uh, been able to um, kind of continue to carry on the mission of uplifting athletes and, and continue to build out our programming and, and how we impact and, and work with the rare disease community as a whole. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more now about um, the, you know, the uplifting athletes organization and, and what we do. Um, so our, our mission is to inspire the rare disease community with hope through the power of sport. How we do this is by helping athletes uh, at all levels, high school, college, and professional, um, realize the platform that they have as athletes and then leverage that platform to support the rare disease community. Um, this is, can be anything from, you know, participating in fundraisers, ho hosting uplifting experiences, or just using their platform to raise awareness for, for the needs of the rare disease community. And, um, so we've been very fortunate in that, right. Um, but one of the things I wanted to focus on today was really the, uh, a program of ours called the Young Investigator Draft. So at Uplifting Athletes, we have four main programs. Our, our Uplifting Leaders Program, we have a network of chapters throughout the country, uh, that are student athlete led chapters now um, with primarily our, our background is, is in college football. So we have a lot of college football chapters and we've just this year started to expand into women's sports and to uh, non-football chapters as well. So we're really excited about uh, kind of that step as an organization and how we're able to continue to, to grow the programming to be more inclusive of everybody uh, from the athletic side that wishes to participate. So our uplifting leaders program is really put in place to help these athletes uh, who are mostly division one athletes have the opportunity for an internship like experience and have some exposure to the rare disease community um, and help them provide the platform to, to kind of uh, do good through what they're already doing as athletes on campus uh, or in the professional ranks. And so the uplifting leaders programs are uh, the first program that we have. Uh, the second one is, um, rare disease awareness, which is really baked into everything that we do. We believe that we're uniquely positioned as an organization uh, because we have this connection with the athletic community. And so many people that support us are our athletes or supporters or fans of the athletes that we work with. And so that really creates an opportunity for us as an organization to bring genuine awareness to, uh, to an audience that, that isn't familiar with the stories and the facts about rare diseases. So for us, this is uh, an opportunity to kind of leverage this relationship that we have with the athletic community to tell these important stories and tell, um, tell more about what we do in the rare disease community and, and how those people can help support us in the rare disease community. Um, the third program that we have is um, the, so let's say we did uplifting leaders, uh, rare disease awareness and uplifting experience is the third one. So this is a program that we're gonna be investing a lot in uh, we're going to be investing a lot in in 2022. We're really excited. This is something that we've done um, as long as the organization's been around, but we've really took a, a step back last year um, and just really knew that there needed to be more resources committed to make this program become what we wanted to, want it to be. Um, and so the Uplifting experience, Experiences program in theory is really connecting athletes with patients in the rare disease community um, and their families. And so we've done this for uh, a number of years in, in, in many different ways as well. We have, uh, up until the pandemic hit, we, the six years prior to that, we did a bowling event with the Notre Dame football team where we'd have just members of the rare disease community in South Bend, Indiana, but would come and, and bowl with the, the football team, which was awesome. And um, I guess the last year we did that was 2019. And we had uh, over 120 people there bowling with us. And I think that's just, uh, it was it was incredible for a small community like that 
I think it shows how, um, you know, how prevalent the rare disease uh, rare diseases are and how big the rare disease community actually is. Um, so for us, that was a, a, a great program and one we want to continue to, to grow, um, but also doing things like um, the partnering with the Kansas City Royals and they hosted us for a, a baseball game and we had um, seven families in the Kansas City area join us for uh, a baseball game and got to meet players before the game and go down to the field. So things like this where we can provide those unique, uplifting, positive experiences for uh, patients and their families to kind of take a break from the, the day-to-day grind of, of what it means to, to go, through tre- go through treatment and, and um, really just be concerned about your rare disease all the time. And, and I think this is an opportunity for us to um, kind of expand, uh, you know, the opportunities for patients in the rare disease community to, you know, have a positive and uplifting experience, provide some hope, um, you know, for them while they go through this, this journey. And so the final program is our rare disease research program. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that, um, just because this is a, a special program that we've actually had the, the good fortune of partnering uh, with OHF on in 2020. Um, So the Young Investigator Draft was uh, launched in 2018, and the idea behind the Young Investigator Draft was to really help us um, do a better job of funding and supporting research in the rare disease community. Uh, It's a very unique program. I don't think there's anything else really much like it. Um, And what we did was took the concept of the NFL draft, and instead of drafting the top athletes in the country, we draft the top rare disease researchers in the country. And so uh, this is an opportunity for us to elevate and celebrate researchers doing the uh, vital work that is required for us to develop the future treatments and cures in the rare disease community. And so from, from that aspect, um, you know, we, we took this NFL draft model and, and just treated the researchers like they are uh, the stars that they are. And um, for us, this is we just held our fifth young investigator draft in February at Philadelphia's uh, the Philadelphia Eagles Stadium at Lincoln Financial Field. Um, and for me, one of the coolest things that has kind of uh, occurred over the five years of the young investigator draft is just to see the impact that we've been able to make. We started this program, and uh, I think we were a team of two or three at that time, and and now we're uh, almost a team of seven five years later. And so to see the organization grow and this program grow is something that's been really special. Um, as I mentioned, we partnered with OHF in 2020 to, to co-fund Dr. Jonathan Whittemore from the University of Florida uh, and his research, which has been uh, just an incredible opportunity to connect with all these different patient advocacy organizations and learn more about what they're doing. Um, but for us, so this year we, we funded um, nine researchers this year. We, fund, we started at six and we've made our way up to nine now. So we funded $180,000 in research grants this year. And uh, now through this Young Investigator Draft Program, we've funded over 34 different researchers from 27 different patient advocacy organizations and $620,000 in research grants, which um, you know, for us is uh, something that we're incredibly proud of as an organization. And I think honestly, the most exciting part for us is that we're just getting started, that we're still learning, we're still growing. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to, to continue to develop this program um, in a unique way to, to kind of connect this platform that we've uh, built with the, the athletic community and to use it in a meaningful way to, to drive progress and hope in the rare disease community. So I have a video. I'm going to kind of go by that just because I think it'll take too much time. But um, I wanted to kind of share a little bit more about the, the Young Investigator Draft and how it works. So um, we put together a, a request for applications. And so this process, we have this, this kind of grand vision of, of reimagining the way that we fund rare disease research and, and really even a bigger scale medical research and really making sure that we're putting the patients at the center of our programming and, and, and our work. So in a, in a traditional um, uh, application model, a researcher might say, hey, here's my work and here's what I'm applying to do, um, will, will you fund me? And we, we taken that and um, we realized that through that process, there was two key issues that we wanted to address. And we, we thought that by kind of changing the process of which a person applies for a grant that we could you know, hopefully address them. And, and the first one is that researchers are spending anywhere from 40 to 60% of their time um, 
just to seek funding, not even conducting their research. And so um, that's a lot of time for a, a person who not only is um, you know, well-educated enough and, and, and driven enough and um, you know, has the talents and abilities to do that research, like it's a lot of a lot of time for them to not be doing what they're they're most well positioned to do, and so we think we believe that by um, partnering with uh, a patient advocacy organization to jointly fill out that application, it's an opportunity for them to connect with this patient advocacy organization and say, "Hey, I'm a researcher. I want to help you and your patient community." Now, can this be a a be mutually beneficial in that you can help? And that patient advocacy organization can use their their resources and and their um, abilities to help support financially that researcher on an ongoing basis and help grow that relationship over time. The second key issue that we wanted to address was really born out of um, researchers oftentimes have worked in silos and no matter how talented or gifted a researcher might be, they may be working on something that is not the highest priority for that patient population. And so again, by building this connection between the researcher and the patient advocacy organization, we're able to ensure that what that researcher is working on is of the highest priority for those patients and what they need. And it's these two kind of simple um, concepts that we wanted to, to do our best to address by kind of the functionality of how the, the research processes hand or the I guess grant award process is handled. So that's kind of what makes us a little bit different, a little bit uh, unique in this whole process. Um, so a researcher partners with the patient advocacy organization, they submit a grant application to uplifting athletes. We have a scientific advisory board that reviews those applications and we have a unique challenge in developing a scientific advisory board that can understand uh, applications coming from across the rare disease community. And so uh, how we kind of uh, have been able to address this is that we wanted to bring in scientists, doctors, MDs that were um, kind of in all different aspects working in the rare disease community, but in their bringing their own perspective. So, for example, we have a, a former um, uh, surgeon from Johns Hopkins who is now kind of has this unbelievable experience as an MD has a child with a rare disease and now is able to kind of use their, their medical background and their understanding to um, kind of bring that, that expertise to our, our grant review process. We have a director at the NIH, we have um, people who are primarily focused on, on genetics. And so it's really a, 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 a board that is built up with these unique perspectives and backgrounds. And so it makes it uh, a, a, just an awesome, opportunity to, to sit and listen to the Scientific Advisory Council go through these grants and, and the different perspectives. And so going through this process, we, we select um, the top grant applications that we receive each year. And then um, those grant awardees are honored through our Young Investigator Draft. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that we, I just addressed here. And the analogy that we use for our audience uh, being athletic, uh, in, athletically inclined usually is that we say, imagine if the NFL athletes that play games on Sundays, if they had to spend you know, Monday through Thursday just fundraising so that they could have the equipment to, to practice on Friday and play a game on Sunday. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we you know, ask the same of the researchers that we're expecting to find cures. So for us, this is kind of that analogy that we are able to kind of drive home with the uh, the athletes that we work with, the student athletes, they they get that, they understand that, and they say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So, what can we do to fix it? And that's what we're trying to do through the Young Investigator Draft. Um, and really, uh, the the cornerstone of the Young Investigator Draft is its collaboration, right? It's not about it's not about uplifting athletes. It's not just about the researcher. It's not about any one patient advocacy organization. It's about our ability to work together. Um, there's no one industry partner, one uh, patient advocacy organization or researcher that's going to solve all the needs of the patient, or I'm sorry, of the rare disease community. And so um, collaboration is key. We need to be able to work together. And, and we hope to lead by example in this and how we've developed the young investigator draft process and, and understanding that this is a team effort, right? And the other thing that's really important is like we haven't funded $620,000 in grants over the last uh, five years to 34 different researchers by ourselves, right? That has been because 
we have an incredible community of athletes and, and donors and sponsors, but also we have an incredible network of patient advocacy organizations that we've been able to work with and researchers that have been able to dedicate their lives to this work. So this is not something that you know, we are doing by ourselves. It's something that we do as a part of the rare disease community. And I think that's something that we want to continue to, to build off of um, as we grow and learn. I'm, I'm still relatively new in, in this world. I feel like I, and, you know, I've been a patient now for, you know, a, a dozen years, but, um, you know, even a, an executive director now for the last five years or so. And I think it's just so important that we want to keep learning, keep understanding how we can use what we're creating at Uplifting Athletes to impact the broader rare disease community. So one of the things that we uh, we launched in the fall of 2020 and has been in place now for, um, I guess, three young investigator drafts, two full young investigator draft processes, is uh, we launched our underrepresented researchers in medicine initiative. And um, really, this was born out of the, the conversations that we had as a, I, I feel like as, as a country around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, we had put out a statement um, in uh, July of 2020 um, in the wake of the, the George Floyd murder. And we knew as an organization and we understand that uh, we serve two very diverse communities in the rare disease community, the athletic community. And we wanted to be make, made clear where we stood on, on these, these matters of diversity, equity, inclusion. But at the same time, I'm not about just saying things. We have to actually do things and, and put action in it behind those words. And so we developed this underrepresented researchers in medicine initiative. We identified this as a way that within our mission at Uplifting Athletes, we could continue to positively, positively impact the rare disease community as also work towards driving equity in rare disease research. Um, so this underrepresented researchers in medicine initiative, uh, the core concept behind this is that we want to provide researchers from all backgrounds to be recognized through the Young Investigator Draft amongst their peers. So there's really two parts to the uh, URM initiative. And uh, the first is really that it puts the, the onus on us at Uplifting Athletes to ensure that we are doing a better job of doing the outreach about you know, for the Young Investigator Draft, making sure that we're building the connections at historically black colleges and universities, um, institutions that serve Hispanic populations and indigenous populations, that these researchers are able to have that opportunity. And, and it is really on us as an organization to go and build those relationships and seek those partnerships. So that is something that we have put on, on us and uh, Amy Lund has joined our team. Uh, Amy joined in July of 2021 and has been a fantastic asset to helping us kind of develop and grow the program. Um, and then from there, uh, we, uh, the second part of this is really ensuring that these researchers that when they apply have a, a fair opportunity to be recognized. And so what we would do in a scenario like uh, this year where we had nine grants to award, I would ask the Scientific Advisory Council to provide the top eight grant awardees through, uh, or through, the, through that nomination process. And if there was an underrepresented researcher within those top eight, I would, uh, we would simply take the ninth best rated uh, researcher and then those would be our ninth grant recipients. If there was not an underrepresented researcher within the top eight, we would take the highest rated underrepresented researcher and these would be our nine uh, grant awardees. And so uh, one of the things I'm proud, of, I know we have a long way to go, but we funded three underrepresented researchers in the last two years that have been really incredible and, and their stories have really resonated. I think you know, one of the things that's most important to me about this is that it's not really an issue uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to this topic. It's, it's an issue of public health. We all do better when we see people and, and hear from people who look like us. And so we want to be sure that we're providing those opportunities to everybody impacted by a rare disease, that they have that opportunity. And so um, you know, this is something that we believe is, is a big picture thing and not just a rare disease thing. Um, and so this is something that we're continuing uh, to be committed to uh, for, for years to come. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's most of what I had for today. But um, if you have any additional questions, I'm happy to take them. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to, to present and talk about uplifting athletes. Rob, that was so inspiring. And I just have to say, one of the things that I take away is you said saying things is one thing, but doing is another. Yep. And, and I think, you know, when we think about harnessing the power 
and, and what this webinar is all about, that is the truth of it. Yep. If we, we can all say we want something better, but unless we start to look at ourselves and dive deep, we're not going to make a change. And Anthony and Rob, you know this as patient advocates and also living with rare disorders, no one is more set to be an advocate other than you and your voice. And I think when we do that together, um, I noticed Jean Campbell came in on one of the chats and she was just congratulating the two of you. And Jean is an incredible force to reckon with um, in the rare disease space. And, and she's been a mentor and a friend of mine and a colleague, but I always take away things that Jean say to me. And when I was looking at uh, a definition of what is harnessing the power, uh, this came up. So I'll read this to you and then I'll turn it to Julie because I know there's a lot of questions. If you harness something such as an emotion or a natural source of energy, you bring it under your control and you use it. So I ask all of you that are watching this video, either with us live today or at another time, think about that and what can we do and harness the power to make a change for the future. And on that, I'll turn it to Julie, but thank you, it was excellent. Yes, thank you guys, it really was. I've had a lot of questions come in. I have actually people emailing me them and some came in through the chat. So the first one is to Anthony, what is the origin of the name Overjoyed for the Playability Initiative? that you spoke about? All right, so oh, it's kind of two parts to it. So one part is technology. It's an overlay joystick on your computer, but also it's the feeling you get when you're able to actually play video games again, and the feeling you get that you're able to do what you love again. And also it's kind of the feeling that I get being able to develop it for everybody and be able to work directly with people in the rare disease community to try to make it better and make it and adapt it to them. Beautiful. It's just an incredible initiative. I, it's just amazing for so many people now. Uh, next question goes out to Rob. How do you see the Young Investigator Draft and Uplifting Athletes commitment to rare disease continue to evolve in the future? I know you spoke about that a little bit at the yeah. end, but I'm sure you're already thinking five years out. Yeah, we are. So we want to, um, you know, we always, I, I mentioned this, I think that we wanted to constantly reassess our place in the rare disease community and that what we're doing is what is most beneficial for the community at large. And, um, you know, we've seen the Young Investigator Draft be successful, but the Young Investigator Draft is, is part of our rare disease research program. And it is the only thing currently under our, our rare disease research program arm at this moment. And I think for us, there's there's opportunities to expand. So there's opportunities to you know give more grants to the Young Investigator Draft. But there's also opportunities for us to to take a look at how do we maybe take a step back and how do we get more people that could become Young Investigators. So that kind of speaks to you know do we um, you know, look to do more with uh, students that are maybe in their residency or students that even further back you know going through undergrad or, or uh, graduate school and connecting with them and and kind of showing them this path, that this path is an option for them, that if they you know, wish to change lives and, and, and have that skill set of, of being um, someone who could dedicate you know, themselves to research, you know, this is an opportunity for you. I think we all know in the rare disease community that um, you know, we're not at a point where we have too many researchers, right? So as many as we can kind of draw uh, into the rare disease community is, is really important. I think you know, through the Young Investigator Draft, showing that there's there's organizations, there's money, there's support um, that is waiting there for them is, is a really big piece of this, is that we have researchers that may want to or think about rare disease, um, but think there's maybe not an opportunity for them because there might not be any funding. And I think that's the um, what the perception we're trying to to change or alter. You know, you don't have to take your talents and and go to um, you know, more common illnesses, maybe like, uh, you know, a heart disease or, or a breast cancer, where there's, you know, an incredible amount of money and funding and support, but here you can make a tremendous impact with that, with that same time. So that's where we're kind of continuing to look at and, and to assess how we can continue to make that impact in the rare disease community. And, and Rob, I think to your point earlier on, the, on even looking at underserved researchers, we have so many underserved patient populations, right? 
And so if, if together with your organization and Anthony's charge and the OAF, OHF charge and, and all the people in our community to start to look at patients in the under, underserved communities and how we can rally and, and sort of give everyone a voice at the table. There's plenty of room yes. at the rare disease table yes. and uh, that thing extends pretty far. So I, I hope to see us uh, more in the driver's seat in, in that component and also assisting your, your organization. So thank you. Awesome. Next one's for Anthony. Um, what are the three things in your life that motivate you the most? And I'm very interested to hear. So I would say the first thing is definitely the music. I have, uh, from a young age, I've always loved to write song lyrics and to make music with my friends. Um, I continue to do that to this day. And I think, I think I love writing music because it allows me to share my story uh, and story of who rare disease in a unique way that kind of the power of music to motivate others is very impactful. Um, and that's why I just love to hear to do it. And I also love to uh, write down my story and share my experience on Facebook. I'm also trying to find other ways to share it and write a blog or something like that. But I think just like seeing a day to day experience of someone with rare disease. I think is just very impactful as well. And I guess the other thing that empowers me is the fact that my family and brother and sister and everybody in my family, they really treat me just like anybody else. And I want to make sure that everybody in the rare disease community also feels the same way. Great, thanks. Um, I have one more question. I think we're gonna wrap it up from there. We could, this hour is going so, so fast. Uh, Rob. What do you enjoy most about your work at Uplifting Athletes? Is that a hard question or an easy question? No, uh, it's an easy question. It, I, I do, and I enjoy the people that I get to meet in the rare disease community. Uh, they're, they're all amazing and awesome and have this understanding of, um, you know, what it, you know, what we've all been through. And I think that's something that is, um, that, that empathy and, um, emotional intelligence that we gain, you know, when we're, we're faced with these challenges is, uh, is really, uh, you know, it humbles everybody. It humbles us that I I've been humbled going through this. And so, um, the, the people without a doubt that we, we get to engage with and, and have an impact on is, um, is the best part for me is just being able to connect and, and see everyone. And, um, you know, that, that's my biggest, uh, thing, the, the team that I get to work with everybody, um, you know, that we worked with through the Young Investigator Draft. It's, it's really incredible. So the people far and away are the best thing about this. Yeah, you can see that you guys are both very personable. Um, so how can you make a difference today? Um, we just want to throw this up and kind of bring it back to the Oxalosis and Hyperoxylaria Foundation with everything that you've shared today. Share your story, everyone. I think you've heard that both from Rob and Anthony. This is huge because you matter. You need a treatment and a cure, and you won't be and should not be dismissed. So we want to have you share your story, and everyone wants to hear. Participate in OHF surveys and questionnaires. It's a quick way to elevate your voice. Don't just view an OHF social media post or newsletter. Uh, next time you're reading through, maybe click that button and, and take action. Join the OHF community. You can email us here. Let us know who you are, where you are. We're a global international foundation. So we're here for everyone in the entire world. And we'll let you know how you can get involved. Host a fundraiser. Those are simple, fun. Host it with your peers, your friends. Keep it simple. Keep it virtual if you'd still like to. And you join this webinar today to harness your power to make a difference. And there's a reason for that. So just don't be afraid and take your next step. A big shout out here. Kim might even shout these guys out as well. Thank you, Anthony and Rob, for sharing your stories and reminding us if we harness the power within us to take even one action, small or large, it might be the change that we're all sitting around waiting to see. Our next upcoming webinar is Friday, March 11th. Don't miss out. What's causing my kidney stones? You can go to ohf.org, our website, or any of our social media pages to find out how to register and sign up for that one as well. 
A big thank you to our sponsors for OHF On the Road webinar series, and especially to our partner sponsors, El Nylum and Dicerna. And that's all we have today. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thanks.